Welcome back to Inclusive Design 24, 2023, brought to you in partnership with our platinum supporters, Google and Intopia, and our gold supporters, Barrier Break and Tetralogical. You can follow us on Mastodon, and if you have questions for the presenters, post them using the ID24 hashtag, or post them in the YouTube chat, or for our Q&A, at the end of the set at, at the end of the session. A reminder that ID24 is a respectful community and you can find our code of conduct on the Inclusive Design 24 website. I am thrilled to be joined by my guest host, Mike Herschel. And Mike, over to you. Thank you, Kathleen. So next we have Jennifer Strickland, who's just talking about the global impact with accessibility and progressive enhancement. And over to you, Jennifer. Welcome everyone. Um, before I get started, I just wanna point out, you can access the slides. I put, put them up on GitHub. So if you wanna follow along separately, they are there. Um, so this talk was posted as Save Our World with Accessibility and Progress progressive enhancement, but my company decided it was too close to our tagline, solving problems for a safer world. So we're gonna talk about this as global impact. Um, so what to expect? What's the problem here? Like, is there a problem? What are the costs and what, what's, it, what's it doing to the world and our businesses and people? And then we're gonna talk about how to save the world, how each of us can make a difference. Um, and then we'll just jot down the key takeaways. So I'm a designer and dev in DC. I work for the MITRE Corporation. I volunteer with US Digital Response. And I am um, a member of the World Wide Web Consortium. I chair the Equity Community Group and would love to have more members. So please join us. You can reach out to me and let me know how I can help. And I'm um, I was an invited expert with the Accessibility Guidelines Working Group, and now because my company is a member, I'm a member. And if you're looking to participate with their B3C, reach out. I'll help you find the door because I can tell you that it's really hard to find the door. So what's the problem? So how many of us have ever been on a team where we're expected to rush? And in that rush, people make choices about what priorities are and they cut corners. More often than not, they cut corners with accessibility, equity, sometimes security, you know, they sure, they make sure it's secure, but not as secure as it could be. And then web performance, which impacts user experience. So what is accessibility and progressive enhancement? I feel like most of the folks here in this audience get it and they know what accessibility is, but just in case, um, it's the practice of making information, activities, services, environments, sensible, meaningful, and usable for as many people as possible. We often think about it as just related to people with disabilities, but it really could be people who um, have poor broadband uh, in a rocky area where they can't put fi uh, fiber cable down, could be being in a airport and it's really loud and you can't hear the TV um, or the announcements much less. Um, and progressive enhancement is a technique that focuses on progressively <laughs> enhancing an experience um, so that makes sure that there is a baseline of usable um, service. And this means, I mean, so compare progressive enhancement to graceful I always get mixed up. I always say graceful degradation, but I mean graceful degradation, degra you know, where it degrades <laughs> gracefully. Um, and progressive enhancement is the one that, from my perspective, from what I've seen, is more equitable because you get a solid foundation for absolutely everybody. Whereas the degrading gracefully, you, the people with the best equipment and the best service, they get the best experience and everyone else gets the trickle down poop. <laughs> so how do those corners get cut? Well, up front in that shift left, design and strategy, business folks, where we decide to do our discovery research, how we do the design, 
all of those places are opportunities where things priorities get established. Then in development and QA, because people more often than not, if schedules are funky, developers never get an extension on a schedule. It's I've never seen it happen. And so they'll quickly use a framework. They'll just do what's quick and um, got to get it done. And then images and video adding those. Some of those decisions are also happening in design, but that's a big deal. What about semantics? The, has the designer indicated what the semantics are for, you know, and indicated what kind of HTML elements need to be in place? I rarely see it, sadly. Um, and then the types of technology that they choose and uh, decisions that are made. Where does it cost and how does it impact? So access here, one of the goals of this presentation is to give you the data you need in order to make these, um, ensure that the priorities for accessibility, equity, security, sustainability get considered and prioritized up front. So here's some numbers you can use. 97.4% um, of the world's top 1 million websites don't offer full accessibility. So that means at the other end here, 3% of the internet is actually accessible. And then most businesses don't even know that they have to make things accessible. 1 billion people in the entire world live with a disability that we're aware of in the statistics. And over a quarter of American adults live with a disability. I imagine that number goes around in other countries. Um, I remember at M Enabling Summit last year, a um, couple of countries indicated that they were, didn't even count people with disabilities in their census, so they have no data on how many people actually have disabilities. So when we get frustrated in the in the first world, what do you, what do we call it now? The whatever America, UK, China, places like that where we have all the stuff, and we actually actually I don't even know if China does acknowledge disability more things to look into. Um, there are other ways of looking at models of disability around the world. What does it cost? I really love this piece that Carl Groves wrote. Um, the best way to save money, like if you're running a business and you're getting contracts out there, the best way to make the most of your money is to prevent those issues from upfront. The worst take you can do is that whole like audit fix, audit fix cycle, um, because it just keeps moving, moving it till after, and then it's more work. So why would you do it that way? Plus it means you're also having fewer people that are actually able to use whatever you're putting out there. Just don't do it. Plus that legal risk. Um, if it's not accessible, then the businesses um, don't meet their full audience and they lose profits. If a government fails to support everyone they're responsible for, the, the people are vulnerable to various things. And then there's the legal stuff. Organizations can be sued and governments and contractors can be found in breach of contract if they don't deliver on accessibility compliance at least. What about security? Security issues result from design and development decisions. And a lot of times people don't know what they don't know. So these things happen by accident. But our lack of knowledge on these things um, is an issue. And we really should learn a little bit more every day about all of these different things, unknown unknowns that we carry. So here are a bunch of different statistics that you can use to dig in um, and all of the links, all of the sources are at the end of the deck and also in the notes page on each slide. Um, so, you know, 64% of uh, Americans specifically had experienced a major data breach. And then 71% see cyber attacks as a major threat to the US. And next year with our election coming up, it's gonna be even greater. Um, at least that's what the news outlets are saying. 15% um, had email accounts or social media accounts taken over. Sadly, it's happened even to me. Like I lost my Instagram account. 
Um, but anyway, these are some numbers you can dig into to make that case with your um, the people you answer to and collaborate with. So, um, and then as we live longer, we too become the seniors and more seniors have disabilities or considerations that are disability oriented. And if you've got to rely on someone else for help, there's some privacy that you're giving up and you're higher risk of being taken advantage. And that's where this familiar fraud comes in, where people that you trust, spouses, caregivers, take advantage of your identity. Plus, honestly, it's human dignity. Let's respect it. Everyone wants to be able to be independent and make decisions for themselves without having to rely on someone else. What about equity? So equity means recognizing we do not all start from the same place and must acknowledge and make adjustments to imbalances. Now, um, with the equity community group, um, we have been using this definition as the foundation to define equity for the W3C and all of the projects that we are working on there. We're also using the accessibility maturity model that they spoke about in the last session to something similar for equity. So come help us. Um, but it also means that we may need to be more partial to historically disadvantaged populations in the decisions we make and prioritize those who maybe haven't had access in the past or had to do a lot of work. You know, that disability, tips, that's a real thing. And digital equity is, ensure about, is about ensuring everyone, no matter where they live or their circumstances can fully participate in society and our economy. Before the pandemic, one in five teenagers in the US said they'd been unable to complete homework assignments. So they didn't have a reliable internet connection. They also didn't have like broadband. And it isn't just people who live in rural places, it's also people who live in urban areas. That's spotty as well. And then also the lower their income, the more the less likely they had a wire line, wire broadband service. And then it breaks down by race as well. Um, so as you can see here, about 80% of white households have broadband access at home and about 80% have a laptop or desktop at, at home. But it gets down to 60% for Hispanics and black actually having a broadband access at home or a, lap, a desk or a computer. And then, um, when it breaks down to um, who actually has the disability and breaking it down by race, here are some more numbers that can help you make your case um, for understanding how these um, inequitable experiences that we design can impact folks. Now, this is the biggie. What about? household net worth. So if you don't have a disability, that's this um, lighter color one on the right-hand side of the two pairs. If you don't have a disability and you're white, your household income is about 130K. If you're black and don't have a disability, it's about 15K. If you're Latin, it's 20K. Now add a disability in there and you're white. It's your household income is just over 20K. Black, I can't barely see that little sliver down there. Latin, probably 15K. That's a serious difference. Remember that disability tax we were talking about? Add that, compound that by race and we've got some serious, serious inequity. Um, and uh, some of Crystal Preston Watson previous, previous talks go into this in a little more detail. And then my colleague at MITRE, Andrea Urqueta Alfaro, who um, these various race and uh, race statistics come from, 
uh, she used to work at the National Disability Institute, and they came out with this wonderful report that really needs much more reading. Um, there's a lot of great data in there that can help make the case with people that you work with. This one, people couldn't believe this actually was not a mistake. It's real. What about web performance? One of my personal favorite topics. Um, so it's not just the actual speed, but it's also the perceived speed um, for a web experience to load fully. Tammy Everts has a great book um, that is linked at the end as well. And follow that woman. She does great work at Speed Curve now. Um, so why are they, why are your websites slower? It's mostly because they have these embedded JavaScript and or CSS frameworks. They're built for, and when people are designing and building and making decisions, they presume that people have the devices and the bandwidth to handle them the same as they have. But the reality as we've seen is that people don't. So over the last 10 years, sites have grown from less than a meg to two and a quarter megs, and they just keep getting bigger. I personally am not a fan of just throwing a framework up throwing and putting in the little bits and pieces of content and not evaluating how much things cost. Um, to me, putting up a web service is like, okay, here's a sandwich. I want this sandwich. It's got whatever I want inside and bread and whatever condiments I might want. But to get that sandwich, I'm just gonna buy the whole grocery store. That's what it's like working with these various frameworks. And that's not good for the user experience, but it's also not good for some other things we'll get into. So what about mobile device, um, mobile devices and web performance? So when we think about web performance, we need to recognize that mobile devices, whether it's a phone or a tablet or whatever, um, and by this, I'm not talking about touch UIs on the computer so much, which sometimes we loop into mobile interactions for design. Um, but the statistics on the adoption of mobile devices, um, not that long ago, people just didn't have them. You know, look when the numbers actually start for a smartphone um, at 2011, 10, that's when uh, people started owning a smartphone in 2011 here. Um, there were cell phones of some kind, but just over half the population had one back in 2002. And nowadays, nearly everyone does. Um, and for smartphones, only 85% have a smartphone. We, we who work in tech, we of course have them. That's sort of a given to us. Um, I think that no matter what my income, I have to have one because it's part of my job. But do I? I almost think I need to have an old flip phone and make sure that things I work are somehow usable. And I do should. And then broadband access. So in 2000, 1% of the population, and in 2021, 75%. That's a huge boom, but it's still not everybody. And if they want to go to the library, for example, to have access to broadband, it's usually older devices and connections that are used by a lot of other people, and it may not be the fastest. Um, with uh, the United States, we have a... Um, Bridging the Digital Divide initiative where there's money being given to a ver variety of places where there is lack of broadband. But what about around the rest of the world? And I mean, there are people all around the world with you know, a need to get connection and communication, or we can talk about the usual business angle, want to buy things. But what about just talking, talking to one another, the great promise of the web that Molly and Tim Berners-Lee and all of us who were around three decades ago working on this stuff aimed for. Um, I wanna carry Molly's memory in my 
efforts to make sure that there is that ability for the web to be free and for me to be able to communicate with someone in Bangladesh or New Zealand at any time in any way in whatever way that the bear that it is open with no barriers and we, we all need to carry Molly's fury and passion and smarts along with us in her memory and a reminder along that side along that side of 75 percent have broadband well it depends there's still a lot of folks who don't um and the poorer, the lower how the lower an income, the less likely. So the people who actually really, really need it to survive may not be able to access the services. I work in public sector um, government, and a lot of the things that we build real are people services, their lifelines, and things that they have a right to. And again, a reminder about the broadband. So just knowing that there's an equity consideration here. And then this is the other piece, sustainability. All of these considerations we make for accessibility and progressive enhancement, they have impact on um, how much pollution we create. And the internet, if it was a country, it would be the seventh largest polluter. And more information at the Sustainable Web Manifesto. And Digital technologies emit 4% of greenhouse gas emissions, and it's increasing by 9% every year. Um, this resource on online video um, from the SHIFT project is something to definitely check out. So often I'm on a project and they'll say, let's just create a video that, that helps people understand this. And I just, my head feels like it's just going, it's suddenly in a vice and wants, it's just going to pop because here I am recording a video talk, but I really don't love video. I will instead use the transcript. But so often, how have we gotten to this point where everything is a video? You know, how do you use this interface? Let's put a video. How do you brush your teeth? Let's create a video. It's just, there's a lot of instant uses of video and the decisions we make around video about whether we're going to embed them or use a service, all of these different things compile to that impact on greenhouse gas emissions. So how do we make smarter choices about it? With when, here's another thing, it's where every line of code, every line of code and every little bit of it. It takes energy to execute, to write, to store, and it's a combination of all of these communication efforts. And this is from the Drupal team, which Mike Gifford is on, and he's he's doing a lot of great work in Drupal for accessibility and sustainability. Follow him if you don't already. Um, and more sustainability metrics just in case you need to make that point. And as I said, the sources are in the references section of these slides and also in the slide notes. Um, so we're really contributing to climate change, to the cost of things, the de de oh gosh, degrading of the planet, um, the impact, you know, all of this stuff. And we can make better decisions as people who are digital craftsmen. So how do we fix it? Stop with the cutting of the corners. <laughs> Let's do accessibility beyond compliance. Sure, if you're in the US, you have Section 508. If you receive federal funding, you have to meet Section 508. That uses an old WCAG standard 2.0 instead of 2.1 or 2.2. But those of us who work on the Accessibility Guidelines Working Group acknowledge we aren't covering every accessibility scenario. There's still things that people are learning day in and day out. As a relatively newer member, I'm bringing up that um, we're not covering all disabilities. We're not covering trauma, for example, in our disabilities. And so a lot of the things that we document in the guidelines aren't quite covering all the bases. And 
um, the statistics on people who have things like PTSD or other trauma and trauma-based disabilities, they don't quite work for them. They don't help. And what if we did, how might we not trigger people with trauma-based disabilities? We're working on getting there, but in the interim, we need to go beyond compliance to make sure that we're providing an inclusive and equitable experience for folks out there. So um, when I make the case for accessibility beyond compliance, I talk a lot about mobile use and how it's skyrocketed over, skyrocketed over the last decade. And so 2.1 and 2.2, they have some success criteria for mobile and also for those cognitive considerations. So just meeting section 508 isn't quite gonna get you there. It's, we can also get into a lot of other equity considerations around, for example, that colorblindness uh, affects uh, greater numbers of men than women. And so when we focus more on colorblindness, we're still prioritizing the status quo of society. Um, this is not that talk, so I'm going to try to keep going, but there are other other talks where we can get into um, things around equity and colonialism and all of that. So I wanted to give just a quick short how-to. So these how-tos are on accessibility and progressive enhancement are just very bright, very different from the rest of the slides. But these are just some quick things that you can do. When you're creating a document, for example, remove empty paragraphs, tabs, and spaces that people often use to create white space between between paragraphs, for example, because all of those are read into the read to the user in some screen readers. And then if you also need to take that document and create a PDF, they become unmarked content that needs to be remedi remediated in that PDF. You wanna make sure that you can navigate your documents, for example, in Word using headings, and you can check that in the sidebar navigation. Uh, use a screen reader on whatever device you're using to check the experience of your work, whether you're doing it as a designer or a developer. Um, I'll be honest, I don't remember the keyboard commands off the top. I wear a zillion hats. I always have to look them up. So don't worry about it. That if you get rusty, if you forget things, there's information out there on the web, the great free web. Um, and then there's a Lighthouse extension in Chrome you can do for a preliminary test. That comes, I think that comes built in, yeah. But I also like to add the Axe extension. I've been experimenting with other accessibility extensions like Accessibility Insights. And um, I just used one from IBM the other day. Um, I can't remember the name of it right now, but um, run these automated scans on your web work. Uh, if it's in the browser, run the scan. If it's in a document, um, for example, if you're using Microsoft tools and you go to the review button, they have an accessibility check in there and you can do a lot of checking of your document there. What about progressive enhancement? We can stop cutting corners there. So you want to think about what the key content and functionality that you're building is. And then make sure that is available with the simplest. So even if that means you output a, a seriously an HTML file, not a PHP, not a JS, not, you know, just the basics, um, give that first. Make sure that it loads uh, quickly. Make sure that it uh, loads without JavaScript. Make sure that if CSS fails or images don't load, you still have everything. Um, check it on an old device on a real you know, really poor connection. Uh, you can throttle them and all of that jazz. And then, then enhance on top of that, but make sure you're delivering that simple experience first and that you don't sacrifice that as you continue to layer on for uh, your users. So here is a design um, showing progressive enhancement for a project I did once and we they wanted to have a video card. And so I was trying to show that we, we wouldn't want to just by default deliver an embedded video. Um, 
The basic experience that is needed is to provide a title, a description, how long the video takes, and then a link to whatever service is hosting the video. And you can also provide the box uh, size to the dimension that uh, the video might be at. Or if you're not ever going to embed one or put a picture in, just don't worry about that. But if you're going to then enhance it by loading up a poster image of the video with alt text, then you want to definitely make sure that you've set your dimensions on that box so that when the image loads, the screen doesn't shift. That can be very disorienting for anyone who with motion sensitivity or some of us who also have trauma-based disabilities. And then if you want to embed them, you want to make sure that it doesn't autoplay and it only plays on user action and you want to include the, the, the size of the video because um, a user needs to make a decision if they want to download that file. So regarding embedded videos, it can get a little complicated depending on the service that you're using, whether you're literally putting a video on the page or you're serving it up with a, with a player. Um, so that's a bit more complicated, but I've also showed some code here to show about the show how you would um, build it in HTML. So just this is just so that people have some technique. So what about equity? Antoinette Carroll's definition is um, something that guides me regularly. So. We, equality, yeah, everybody has equal access, but equity makes sure that everyone has equal outcomes. You know, maybe you've seen the, the boxes or the bicycles um, from, oh, I should have put that here, um, where everyone gets a bicycle, you know, so Oprah gives everybody a car, but what if you can't drive a car um, and now you've got a car, you can't drive it. What if you give people instead the transportation that they actually need? Um, maybe she gave them like a hundred thousand dollar Uber card or something, you know. Um, but it's about making sure that everyone can have the same outcome. So how do you get there? How do you improve equity? A big step is to make sure that you have diverse teams. Have people with a whole lot of different life experiences and lived experiences. Um, you also wanna make sure you evaluate your processes and Gareth Ford Williams once talked to me about documenting assumptions and documenting who are we deciding that we will exclude. And every time we make a decision that adds to excluding someone, make sure that person who makes that decision writes that name on the board. Um, or the wall or wherever it is that you're keeping it. It should be physical um, or in your face all the time um, and make sure that you're good with making that decision of excluding that population. Um, you also wanna make sure that you identify risks and communicate them, socialize them and evaluate them. You wanna create an equity definition for the team so that everybody knows what it means and can make their decisions based on it. You'll also wanna talk about who, who has been underserved, um, who are your stakeholders, which has become a touchy word um, due to native uh, populations. Um, so stakeholders still kind of not a great word, but um, I tend to think of it as the people in charge, the people with the big decision-making power. Um, not certainly not the people we serve in the long run, maybe the person, I don't, people who pay our checks, our paychecks. Um, you also want to talk about various indicators and data sources and evaluate any kind of bias or um, in them. You want to identify disparities and barriers. You want to document everything um, and also constantly capture lessons learned and communicate them broadly. You'll want to monitor, measure, and reevaluate all the time. And a lot with equity is about restoring justice and liberation. And so it's something to reflect upon. And I'm going to be honest and say we don't we don't always get it right and we don't all know everything about this. 
Um, but I think being willing to be wrong and trying to get closer to that is the right way to go about this stuff. Um, baseline security. I'll be honest, I, I'm doing my best to keep learning. I have talked to friends. I've got a book. I'm working on it, taking little classes. You want to talk, you want to focus on not just the outside. So not just the passwords, but that's important too. But you also want to create extra layers of protection on the data itself. So when you're thinking about it, create that, uh, those Russian dolls. I wish I could remember what the name of those are. are. And you want to also back up regularly. Um, I know a lot of places I work, they um, don't necessarily have a physical backup. There is a cloud service backup. I've worked places where they didn't have a cloud service backup. So I was like, I feel like I should do something to back it up, but I certainly don't want to put it in the cloud. So I'm going to just, I'll just back up my machine in case something happens. Um, and I won't go into it unless we need to. Um, we want to encrypt all that, all devices and also those backups, encrypt all of that stuff so that if the wrong person gets their hands on it, they can't do anything with it. You also want to make sure you don't have any redundant data out there because that poses security risks. And you want to spend your money and time and test and do all of this stuff for security. Update systems and applications regularly. I know there's been um, uh, iMessage uh, vulnerability going around that's causing a lot of folks to have to update all their Apple devices lately. Um, one of the big ones um, is insider threats. So people who are disgruntled, who maybe are getting lax with their security protocols or other things. Um, strong passwords. Passwords are the way that most folks get into systems. So figuring out how to have strong passwords. Um, and you want to just help cultivate a company, company-wide security culture, like everybody's secure. Instead of just letting people in through the door behind you, you really, everyone just should understand that doesn't happen. That is not going to happen. Responsive web design, love. Um, I think most folks here probably know that it's one website that just fluidly adapts um, instead of a website made for this width and that width and that width or things that just stack. It is not it's just stack. By making a responsive website, you reduce what it takes to deliver that service. And then also the amount of energy and the effort to maintain responsive web design is the bomb. And then sustainable web design and development. So there is a sustainable web design community group with the W3C, please get involved. It's awesome people. They just put their first draft out of guidelines. Um, so it sustainable web design considers all, all of the decisions and the impact on the environment. So it goes really well with accessibility and usability because it they use a lot of the same pra practices. So Build websites and services from scratch. So only the required code is included. A lot of these frameworks, um, there's a lot of unused code that comes with it. And there's a lot more carbon that gets emitted. Uh, you want to make sure you choose uh, hosting services that are using renewable power, renewable energy. Um, avoid video. If it's the only thing that you, like for this, I mean, we're going to have these talks. And this is the method in which we're communicating with one another, right? We're using these videos and we've got this chat and we can talk to each other. This is a place where we can need video, but we don't need it to tell me how to brush my teeth, for example. Uh, optimize images. And if you can deliver them in SVG and WebP, uh, you can look on the web. There's lots of resources for outputting WebP. Um, minimize your code. It'll make things faster. And um, the faster your page or your service loads, the more, more easily assistive technology can connect to it. Um, the longer it takes, the more barriers it introduces. And then leverage lazy loading. Look it up. It's great. Uh, there's a lot of little tricks with uh, doing a lot of these uh, lazy loading techniques or uh, web performance enhancement. Uh, 
um, techniques. But once you start opening that box, it's just amazing um, to learn. And progressive web apps is another direction to head in with all of this as well. So you too <laughs> can have global impact through accessibility beyond co compliance, progressive enhancement, equity, baseline your security, use responsive web design and sustainable web design. And are there any questions? Wow, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. That was that was an amazing talk. That wow, I was blown away. And um we we actually we have a Jean Spellman that wanted to Hi, Jean. <laughs> she wants to thank you. She wanted to thank you for, in particular for mentioning Molly and and we all well, we all know who Molly is. And if for all of you that do not know, Jean is calling, um, shouting out Molly Halschlag, who is the fairy godmother of the web. So I definitely want to um, call attention to that um, before I um, throw this over to Mike Herschel, who does have some questions for you. So um, take it away, Mike. Molly hey, was that a was a friend. So it, yeah. we were supposed to have a call and we just kept delaying because. We were both tired, so it just, yeah. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, your your talk was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that. I have a I have a couple of questions uh, that I thought of as as I was going through. I haven't seen uh, too much on social media. What I really liked is I really liked your grocery store analysis when talking about about web performance. You know, and and so, so my question is, how can we convince developers how to, how to not ship the whole grocery store and only ship the necessary goods? Um, outside of ethics, and and like the ethical case is is very is is the right there. But outside of that, is there a business case behind this? Uh, well, it depends on who you're talking to. So the various mm -hmm. folks, like if I'm talking to a developer, um, I want to find out what's important to them and craft usually is what's, you know, they want to learn, they want to become a better web developer. And so making these decisions, not cutting these corners is about doing your job well. And actually, uh, I contacted uh, Leonie Watson and Derek Featherstone a few, a couple of years ago, because a design lead that I was working with said, inclusive, don't say inclusive design, that's activism. And I was stunned because I just, inclusive design is just, that's what we do because it makes so much sense. Um, and so I reached out to them and I'm like, um, 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 is this activism? And they said, if well, Derek said, if it is activism, then I'm an activist. And <laughs> Leonie said, it's about doing your job well. And don't we all want to do our job well? I can I can tell you that I have seen different experiences based on who the messenger is. And so I've learned to use people to deliver the message um, as a woman with disabilities and being mixed race and older. Um, I think a lot of developers I work with, if they're men in particular, tend to dis discount me. So I'll, ha I'll ask someone else who I know has the clout with them to, to give that message, to go that route with me. Um, and that works better. Otherwise, I'm the one that gets in trouble for being a B word. Um, anyway, that's how I approach it. With business folks, it's a lot easier. They get it. They, when I've, I uh, recorded a video of how long it took a website to load on a slow 3G connection. And they thought that the video was broken and I said, just wait, just wait. And they're like, oh, how do we prioritize web performance? <laughs> so show them. That's a that's a great idea. Videos are very very important for that. Uh, that's that's fantastic. So I have a I have a couple of questions from YouTube uh, for, from you and and also some more thank yous. You know, uh, people are very very happy about your presentation. Um, so a question from Ricky Onsman, uh, Jennifer, what significance do you put on phones becoming the major way of accessing the web? Personally, 
I put them as the, because when I'm not working, it's the only way I use the web. I, I have a cognitive consideration and even before the pandemic, and then with the pandemic and the society that we're living in, I have such limited spoons, if anyone's familiar with spoon theory. theory. And I feel like a lot of them are broken and leaking lately. <laughs> um, and what I love about just my phone is it limits what has my attention. I, can, I don't have to have a bunch of different things coming at me or I have a bunch of browser tabs open on my phone, probably 300 but I can only see one at a time. <laughs> cool. Uh, so it looks like we got about three more minutes. I have another question for you. Um, you may not have an answer, but how do you go about finding the carbon footprint of a website? And this comes from uh, Jeannie Martin. Hi, there's a calculator. Oh, Cracker Jacks. I, say, I sent it to myself. Um, if you ping me on, um, God, finding me on Mastodon is going to be hard because my employer made me take all my contact info out. Um, reach. We should have your contact info on the ID24 website, I believe. Okay, okay great. So, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we can reach out to me. I will find my link, and I'm give I'm giving a next version of this talk at Accessibility Toronto. Uh, this started as a talk I gave at CSUN, but I've built upon it, and I really feel ethically like I should give a diff slightly different talk at each. So um, this will happen again at Accessibility Toronto, and I will have that link then because it was one of those ones I saved. But there is a. Um, <sighs> Uh, a carbon footprint calculator for digital services. Okay. Um, if I don't have it. Mike Gifford does. Um, mm -hmm. Mike Gifford's also just the bomb. Yes, he <laughs> As is. I said it multiple times. I am a big Mike Gifford fan. I, I, so I have one more. We have time for one more question that's very similar to the last. And this is from a person that has a very long username, so I'm not going to try to pronounce it. So it's a similar question to question as Jeannie, but more on finding out the personal internet carbon footprint. Uh, maybe we can embed a reminder plus tips into browsers eventually. That's a, actually a great idea. Yes, yes. Yeah. I one of the one of my biggest guilts day to day is knowing that I have a bunch of stuff in iCloud, in Google Cloud, in Dropbox, yeah. and disks, uh, and I shouldn't, you know, like, I'm a digital hoarder, and I, I know I'm not alone. Yeah. Um, sooner or later, I'm going to look at all those photos I stuck on Flickr, too. Um, and I, I hope to, maybe in my retirement, although Jane keeps so busy in her retirement that I have a hunch that doesn't happen. But we can all do better every day, but we also have to make a decision about what can you do today? And are you sufficiently rested? Have you drank enough water? Have you gotten some steps in and some great sleep? And remember life is meant, so I've nearly died a number of times and I've got to tell you, life is meant to be lived right now. So eat the croissant, <laughs> put the cream in your coffee. Um, find that balance. And the same thing goes with all of these digital decisions. And I know those are the reasons that people often cut corners and say, oh, but we can ship it and we can fix, fix accessibility later. Well, those people who are already out there paying the equity tax and the disability tax are already barely getting by, as we saw from those statistics, that, that one with the like net worth. Let's not cut the corner for their services. Let's really make sure that if inclusive design of act is activism, we're all, I want to use the F word and I'm afraid. I know Patrick might use it, but F and activists. Let's all be activists. Let's all live in Molly's spirit forever and ever. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Jennifer. And with that, um, I want to say, if you like this session, hit the hit that YouTube like button, and don't forget that you can sub subscribe to YouTube.com/slash Inclusive Design Twenty Four to be kept in the loop 
on our future events. Inclusive Design 24 is brought to you with thanks to our supporters, Google, Intopia, Barrier Break, Tetralogical, Intuit, Infoaxia, the Law Office of Laney Feingold. Inclusive Design 24 will be back on the hour with our next session and we will see you then. Thank you everyone.